Uh, my name is Eric Simulant. I'm a Finnish American. I was born in 1965 in Duluth, Minnesota, western tip of Lake Superior. Uh, my interest in canoeing was from a young boy when I knew by about age five that when I grew up, I wanted to be a wilderness canoe guy. So when in my late teens, I got hired on at a wilderness camp and started guiding 10 day canoe trips in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in northern Minnesota and Quetico Provincial Park in southern Ontario, Canada. Uh, the love of canoeing and just being outdoors kind of led to uh, a lifestyle uh, where canoes were very much a uh, central part of my life, um, at least for the summer. In the winter time, I was winter camping and worked at a number of outfits, including the Voyager Outward Bound School, where we started running sled dog teams for winter trips. So between the dog mushing in the winter and canoe travel in the summer, uh, I wanted to learn more about each, and I found that these are very ancient, traditional travel skills uh, that really caught my attention. And it was about that time that I learned about the birch bark canoe and just the sheer beauty of it is what caught my attention and the history, the long standing history, especially when you study the uh, European exploration to North America and take in the uh, great extent of the fur trade across Canada and how the, the French voyageurs and the British uh, Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company partners relied on the birch bark canoe for freight travel. So I was very intrigued with the, the construction of the birch bark canoe. And at the same time, I also studied to learn more about native culture, specifically the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe of the Lake Superior region where I live. So it was really a combination of learning more about the culture and the language of the Anishinaabe people and their use of the birch bark canoe that intrigued me and I felt passionate about learning how to build it. And so for about the last 30 years, I've been studying and building and paddling birch bark canoes, and it's been quite the journey. And as a guest speaker about this uh, for your class, um, it's really encouraging to see your interest, and I really want to encourage everyone to uh, read all you can about it, uh, do a lot of research, and just uh, follow your instincts, you know. Uh, the more canoes you can see, get on the water. You know, there's an old saying that to, to become a better paddler, it's good to, to learn how to row a boat and paddle a kayak because it's it's time on the water and different vessels. I mean, that's a metaphor that you can apply to, to learning in general. And it's very true, uh, especially when it comes to understanding the birch bark canoe, partly because there's so few around today. You know, the times changed about 150 years ago, where a lot of the native cultures, especially in the boreal forest in this uh, region of North America, was uh, in a great transition. And, you know, the assimilation process, of native cultures, native people into mainstream America, and then the access of wood canvas canoes, fiberglass, and modern, you know, contemporary new materials was really the demise of the birch bark canoe. And some people call it kind of a lost art, but realistically, especially the more remote tribes, it's always been there. It's a very strong part of their heritage, and it's also a very important part of their heritage. And I would say the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a great cultural resurgence. And you see this in languages and other customs like drum and song and dance. And certainly the crafts, building snowshoes, building birch bark canoes, some of the more necessary and iconic uh, material culture pieces that uh, have really made a comeback. And people are starting to understand it and perfect the craft once again. And there's a great amount of cultural pride in doing so. So, you know, as a non-native person, uh, dealing and studying and building and teaching these crafts, uh, I highly recommend learning as much as you can about the culture and showing great respect and from an ethical standpoint, be very sensitive about, you know, how this topic is is addressed. 
because we want to give you know full credit to the the indigenous uh, originators of these technologies and it's not just the utility of the canoe it's also about the the cultural uh, values the spiritual aspect of it and that's probably the biggest thing that has uh, retain my interest is just the power within the birch bark canoe and what it represents. So I continue to build canoes, um, less so the last 10 years or so, partly because I've transitioned into uh, the canoe museum work and more historical work. But, you know, when summer comes around, I'm always working on a birch bark canoe and it still retains the passion for me. So that's kind of the my backstory and how I've come to this point. So Muskego is an excellent example of a contemporary birch bark canoe, contemporary in the aspect of uh, a canoe design that was taken on as a secondary form for the, the Lake Superior Ojibwe in the regions uh, south and west of Lake Superior primarily, Wisconsin and Minnesota, a little bit into Ontario as well. I have to jump back and and cover a few broad topics, and that is, you know, the birch bark uh, from the white birch tree is such a superior material for the waterproof covering of the canoe that wherever it grew in North America, the native tribes all preferred it to any other tree bark, and because of that, uh, every tribe. Uh, built birch bark canoes. Uh, we don't know exactly how long. Uh, most people are comfortable saying for at least several thousand years. So there was a long development. And through that time, it seems each tribe had their own style or shape that evolved of their canoe. And I think part of it is based on the, you know, the actual waters that they were paddling. You know, if there's a lot of rapids, big rivers, uh, if there's big swells on big lakes, you want a generally a, a deeper hull, a higher ended canoe, more sheer turn up to protect against the big waves and, and rapid standing waves. Uh, you know, some of the flat water canoes were, were a shallower hull. Uh, some canoes were made for, you know, bringing in, uh, seals over the side of the canoe on the ocean. So that affected the shape of the canoe a little bit. But also, I think what shaped the canoe is the actual landscape. And there's a, there's a strong connection between the, the indigenous people and the land that they live on. And I think there's kind of an underlying parallel between the shape of the land and the shape of their lives. And that translates into everything they make and how they view things. So this is kind of a, more of a spiritual context, but I've learned that that's highly influential in how different tribes develop some of their their homes or their canoes in this case. So that's a kind of an underlying lesser thought about aspect of why and how they would um, build a birch bark canoe in a certain way. Uh, as far as my specific background from Muskego, I was working as a a park ranger and historian for the National Park Service. So I was exposed to a lot of research capability uh, and sources and also a lot of existing birch bark canoes. And I had to go out and seek them out. But over time, uh, I learned the basic uh, history that the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe people, uh, migrated from the Atlantic coast uh, near the eastern mouth of the St. Lawrence River, and for several hundred years ended up coming uh, into the Minnesota region. And the original form of their birch bark canoe, sometimes referred to as the ancient model, is a very high-ended canoe, and it's one of the oldest forms known. Some of the earliest uh, fur traders or explorers that came into, into the St. Lawrence region uh, near present day uh, Montreal or Ottawa, Canada, uh, commented and made sketches. Uh, one person would be Jacques Cartier, uh, year 1535, 
is one of the earliest documented uh, descriptions I know of. But at that time, uh, it seems that the most common canoe shape was this old or ancient form of the Anishinaabe. And it also was very similar to the Algonquin old model. And that form, uh, you know, varied slightly from the Anishinaabe tribes. Uh, the Ojibwe is just one of, of several other tribes within the Anishinaabe um, tribe. And that canoe, to my, in my opinion, is one of the most beautifully crafted as far as the visual lines, but it's also highly functional. It's, it's got a flaring hull, so the more weight you put in it, you displace more water, and therefore you can haul more uh, cargo, and you actually gain stability in that. Compared to some of the canoes that are narrower at beam or width, and that while they're more streamlined, they, they don't have the cargo capacity. And there's there's advantages and disadvantages to, to these designs. But that old form of the Anishinaabe canoe uh, was expanded and enlarged by the fur traders, uh, and that became the main fur trade style of canoe. And so it's that basic shape that migrated west with the Ojibwe people into what's now Minnesota. And when they arrived in this region, they developed a secondary form, tribal form, uh, for their canoes. And many people think it was influenced, and I do as well, by the Cree uh, tribal forms to the north, and especially the Dakota canoes of the west of Minnesota, because this is now the region the Ojibwe were coming into. The Dakota were, were moving west, but the canoe designed in this region was largely based on the ability to effectively harvest the wild rice, which northern Minnesota and Wisconsin has um, it's kind of the wild rice belt of the North America. And it was such an important food source that the canoes were uh, evolved specifically for wild rice harvesting. And the primary difference in between the old form, the ancient form, of the, the Ojibwe canoe and this this newer Western form or contemporary form, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the long nose. And the long nose canoe uh, was significantly wider for collecting the wild rice and it had a flaring hull as well, but it also minimized the number of crossbars or forks in the canoe. And the reason for that is when you're harvesting wild rice, you're using two handheld sticks sitting in the canoe. Uh, the sticks are about an arm's length long, and you reach over the edge of the canoe with one arm, and you pull in the stalks of rice, and with the other stick, you brush the tips of those rice stalks and release the, the seeds or grains of the rice into the canoe. And the old form and most other tribal forms of canoe for stability had more crossbars or forks, but they did not allow a full arm stroke with that extension of the stick into the canoe. So the canoes you see on the western side of Lake Superior and northern Wisconsin elongated the open space of the canoe. So the canoe hull is not quite as strong as the old form, but it's way more effective for getting the rice in the canoe. That's pretty basic. When you're harvesting food, that, that changes your canoe style. But that's how that evolved. The other significant thing about the long nose canoe is the shape of the end. And when we talk about tribal forms, I think the easiest way to start telling the difference and identifying a specific birch bark canoe to its tribal builders is that is the shape of the very end at a profile. And so if we look at a canoe uh, pro uh, from from the side, you can see it's couple things. One is most of the tribal forms were identical end to end. So the front or bow, the shape of the end looked identical or nearly so to the stern, the, the uh, rear of the canoe. And if you look at the actual shape of the end of the canoe, it usually has some curvature to the bow. And that curvature is kind of like a flag. As you think about 
how in, mo in the modern world politics, if you see a certain flag flown, you know that, oh, that's from, you know, that's a flag from Sweden, or that's the United States flag, because of the, 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 um, you know, the imagery of it, the symbols and colors. Well, in a birch bark canoe, it's kind of the same as you look at the end shape of a canoe. And so this end shape of the long nose canoe, the contemporary Western Ojibwe form now, has a very long sweeping center of the, the canoe prow. And sometimes that's referred to as the nose of the canoe. Whereas the chin, the chin of the end of the canoe would kind of be the part that touches the water, the bottom of the curved end. So if you go from the, the chin of the canoe at the water, and then you follow the, the curved end of the canoe up to the midpoint, the nose, and then where it continues up around the top edge of the end, the curvature, and it usually comes back towards the center of the canoe slightly, that would be the, the forehead of the end. And so that's kind of a, you know, a way to talk about and identify the different parts of the end of the canoe. And so the long nose is simply a reflection of how the, the end of the canoe has a long midpoint um, projecting out. And that differs very significantly from the old form, which had a, a more straight end. It had slightly more chin, and then it was a very straight rather than curved uh, line coming upward and back uh, inboard to the, uh, to the top of that uh, end. So, as you look at these canoes, the shape of the end then um, has to be constructed. And the way it's constructed is that the wooden support inside, known as the stem, is a piece that is not visible in the finished canoe. But that is the key component that produces the support in the end, which is later then covered with bark. And that is how the shape of the end gets made. And so, Muskego is a about a 17 foot long uh, Ojibwe long nose canoe, and the reason it's called that long nose is because of the stem piece that's inside that supports the bark on the end and its shape. And every tribe would build canoes, kind of like a flag of a country, in that even though they were different bands of the same tribe, they all shared the same uh, building techniques that produced a standard shape to their tribe. And while different individual builders did it slightly different, it was very uniform across North America that members of a certain tribe would stay, continue to build their tribal form. There was a certain tribal pride in that. And so uh, Muskego reflects the Ojibwe of the contemporary canoe form known as the Ojibwe long nose. And I built that canoe uh, in Grand Portage, Minnesota on the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Reservation, uh, where I work for the National Monument, uh, Grand Portage National Monument, which is a national park site, and they interpret the, the fur trade history, uh, starting in, in around uh, uh, the late 1700s to about 1800. But that time period, uh, the birch bark canoe reigned supreme for commerce because Grand Portage was a key uh, water uh, link between the Great Lakes to the east where they could use much larger freighting birch bark canoes and from Grand Portage west along what's now the U.S. Canada border leading west of Grand Portage, Minnesota um, to the Canadian northwest all the way to the Rockies and the, and the Pacific. Uh, those big freight canoes called Montreal or Canoe de Maitre uh, of the Great Lakes going east of Montreal were just too big. They were sometimes 30 to 40 feet long, uh, up to five feet wide, six feet wide, and they just didn't work in the smaller waters in many portages and rivers of the interior west of Lake Superior. So that's where they downsized the canoe to basically the biggest canoe two men could carry. That way they could get it through the portages single file. And what evolved was any large canoe from about 20 feet to about 28 feet that uh, could navigate that those waterways to the west. And again, the the uh, tribal forms of those fur trade canoes 
were simply enlargement of the old Anishinaabe or Algonquin old form canoe, the higher ended one. And that was for a reason. They were well built, strong, and they were uh, very seaworthy. The higher ends, the larger hull. Um, so uh, coming into the wild rice country was, I think, one of the most important aspects of why the Ojibwe took on that secondary culture or secondary canoe form uh, based on the wild rice culture and harvesting. And so that influenced my uh, desire to build an Ojibwe long nosed canoe, even though I, I preferred the old form prior to that and still normally build the old form. Uh, because I, I like it better for a visual uh, standpoint, and it works well on Lake Superior where I often paddle. And it, they're both very traditional and still built by the Ojibwe in this area, uh, the few that are built. But there are native builders actually building both styles today. So, um, that That's the background of why Muskego was built and where. Traditionally, nails, steel nails were not used. They weren't available. So in the original construction, you're basically using uh, wood parts for all the, the framing of the canoe. Um, I will talk mostly about the Ojibwe canoes because that's um, you know my focus, but realize that these are, are fairly universal techniques all across North America. Um, usually what are used to uh, hold pieces together were wooden pegs. And the most common preferred wood for the gunnels, the, the ribbing, the planking, the stems, um, was white cedar. It's very rot resistant. It's uh, fairly strong for being superior in lightweight. And when heated with water, it's highly flexible. So you can form it and bend it. But it's not as strong as the hardwood. And so for the pegging, uh, usually a hardwood is preferred. I like to use ash. I'll use birch, maple. Uh, the hardwoods in the area where the canoe is being built that are straight drained and available were usually the ones selected. Uh, but to give you an idea of the, of the extensive pegging in a canoe, uh, you can see some in Muskego, especially in the gunwale tap. Um, but you also don't always see the, the horizontal pegging in the gunnels. And in Ojibwe style, both the contemporary and the old form, you're using three rails on each side. You have the in whale, that's usually the stiffer rail for support. And then on the outside of the bark, on the edge, you have the out whale. And you can see those are lashed together with spruce roots. But sometimes uh, the pegs are exposed. Sometimes they're hidden underneath the lashing. But you're you're drilling a hole horizontally through the gunnel, generally every oh, three to six inches, so that you can drive in a hardwood peg so that the two rails won't separate up and down. And then they're lashed together so they don't separate side to side. And you may have 30 or more pegs in each uh, side of the canoe in, in the gunwale alone. So that's one well application of these hardwood pegs. Now later on, when the, the traders came in and steel nails, usually cut nails to begin with, were available, you do see canoes that were made after about 1850 or so occasionally have steel nails in. And they were just quicker, they rusted out, they weren't, and they were heavy. Uh, it wasn't the traditional way of doing it, but it was practical and you saw them do that. Uh, I'll mention other. Uh, another two other materials that really kind of were employed at the same time. One is uh, using cotton canvas to replace birch bark. And then the other one is uh, the synthetic uh, tar or uh, sealants used to replace the traditional pitch. And the pitch is a whole other category on the about new, which is important for sealing it. Uh, but it's uh, a lesser understood aspect of it. But those are the three primary uh, trend uh, material changes that I, I have seen. Uh, but the steel nails, um, if they were available, were used. Other questions?
that was a tribal uh, technique that was employed uh, in the construction of the old Dakota and Cree canoes, where it does have a headboard, but it's often referred to as a bellied in headboard, which means it's kind of like a cedar rib in that it's bent to the shape of the hull. But in the end, in the construction of many tribal forms, especially the old form of the Ojibwe, when a builder creates the stem piece, usually a single piece that's split part way so that you can curve it to the curvature of the end, which uh, comprises that tribal form or the shape of the end I referred to, that stem piece then is usually first fitted to a solid vertical headboard, usually a thicker piece of cedar, um, and that is lashed together, often with another strut involved, to lash it all together, and that collectively is known as the end frame. And then two end frames are constructed to put inside the bent up bark hull during construction in each end. And then it's uh, the bark is laced through the stem piece. And in that old technique, then you have the headboard exposed, which is a very strong, rigid support uh, for the end of the canoe. And it kind of, um, in effect, it, it is a bulkhead in the end of each end of the canoe to create an end wall, so to speak, in the canoe. So in the long nose Ojibwe canoe like Muskego, when the stem is bent, it is not attached to a headboard at all. It is inserted in the end of the canoe and the bark is sewn to the stem. And then later, after the gunnels are sheared up at the end and all the end lashing is done, and the gunnels come up to meet the, the forehead of the stem. Only after that, and the canoe is planked and ribbed fully, is the flexible headboard put in. And if you look close, uh, there is a wooden piece called the, the headboard, but it's a, a much thinner piece and it's heated and bent. So it's kind of, hmm, how do I describe it? It's kind of like the shape of a boomerang. Only it's, uh, it's flat in the end. So it's still a bulkhead or a physical barrier. Uh, so you cannot see the stem. But unlike most canoes with a, a solid vertical headboard that, that is attached to the stem piece, this bellied in headboard of the long nose, like Mosquito, can be removed. Usually if you take the top part of it and just depress it slightly down, you can remove that, that, uh, bellied in thin headboard. And that's one way to get into the end and inspect the stem piece. And uh, you can also clean the canoe that way. Wild rice gets in there sometimes. You have to clean it out at the end of the season. Um, the other thing is that inside those headboards, whether it's a solid headboard in the old form or the bellied in long nose uh, end frame, a lot of builders would stuff in cedar shaving uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's natural rot resistant flotation, but I think most importantly, it's a way to compress the material into that void space in the end where you, it's really hard to get in there and rib the sidewall of the canoe in the very end, which means the bark itself is more, uh, fragile and you could, uh, if you were to hit a rock or stumble into the end of the canoe, there's not ribbing support there to, uh, hold strength to the structure of the sidewall. But by packing in this cedar shading material, it's enough material where you're actually providing continuous support in the end um, so that the sidewall isn't quite as vulnerable. So that's the main um, concepts of supporting the end of the canoe with a headboard and that bellied in headboard. So now you might want to go back and take another look at the headboard on Muskego. And if you're careful, Kurt, you might want to attempt uh, removing that headboard just to inspect it. And I would say spray it down with a little bit of water and soften it for a few minutes so you don't crack it. And if it's, uh, if it's too brittle, uh, you might not want to do it. Right. Okay. Uh, repair work on the Skego has been done. I'm trying to think back. Um, I know, I remember talking with Kurt before 
the uh, transported it south from Minnesota, that the gunwale caps were starting to lift off because some of the ash hardwood pegs had been starting to rot through. Uh, again, uh, ash in the hardwoods uh, don't have the longevity of the cedar. So that's not uncommon in canoes that have been used for uh, a number of years. Uh, Muskego, I believe, was built in around 1998 or so, which means it was about 20 years old and used every year before it uh, made its way to Georgia. And in that time period, uh, some of the quite common ways a birch bark canoe deteriorates is exposure to sunlight. And that will weaken the materials. It'll usually fade the bark uh, from kind of a initially a, a reddish orange color to more of a, a dull gray or even a white color on the outside. And the areas where you could probably see um, repair work would be the gunwale caps with new pegging and also some of the lashings, the root lashings around the gunwale and possibly at places around the gunwale cap as well. Typically the gunwale caps were slightly narrower than the width of the in-whale, bark, out-whale width, uh, so that they didn't get caught with a paddle or fingers and lifted off the gunnel. And yet, they were normally pegged on um, solely, meaning no lashings were wrapped around the top of the, the gunwale cap, because that's a wear point. You know, the paddle, uh, that's a, a, and that's one of the functions of the gunwale cap is to protect the lashings and, and, and add strength to the lateral, um, aspect of that gunwale. Other places that you would obviously often see, uh, ongoing repair, and I wouldn't even call it repair, but mostly just maintenance is the pitching. Pitching is often, uh, cracked in normal use, weather changes, and it's sometimes even a daily job to, to touch up the seams if you develop leak. And that's just the that's just the way birch bark canoes work. You know, they they even with excellent craftsmanship and getting a nice tight pitch job initially, it won't last too long because of natural weather and humidity changes where that pitches will crack. And uh, so that would be another spot you might want to inspect and see if there's you know pitch that you can uh, see is cracking and replace. And sometimes the bare, the bare fat that's rendered uh, into bare grease to temper the, the pitch and the charcoal that was used in the pitch, the resin, uh, will sometimes uh, turn to a white color. And it's just the bare grease in there that, for whatever reason, I don't know if it oxidizes or what the chemical process is, but it often changes color and becomes brittle and weak. And this is, you can see, even on the trees. And that would be one of my... my um, suggestion is the more you can learn about the the trees and the materials used in the canoe you start to gain a better understanding of how the canoe uh, ages and what repairs are needed and just the working qualities of the material the wood the roots the bark the pitch it's uh, the learning curve the i mean the traditional pitch is uh is it's hard to get it right. There's a learning curve. Plus, just getting enough pitch to, to uh, seal a canoe is a major collection effort. Um, and the other thing is, uh, most people don't understand the intricacies of getting that pitch right and how it works. But that's a, as I often uh, say, uh, learning how to master the pitch is one of the key aspects of learning how to, uh, you know, operate a bird bark canoe over a length of time because you have to maintain it. And it is often referred to as a scallop or sometimes simply reinforcing bark. If you think about all the pegs and lashing holes that go through the bark wall underneath the gunnel in the construction of the gunnel, you're putting a lot of holes in a row weakening that sidewall of the bark. And so, Oftentimes, especially if you could not find really thick bark for strength 
and that side bark was somewhat thin. It you could reinforce the bark on that underneath that gunnel uh, with uh, an additional strip. Sometimes it was very plain, just a strip of bark. Uh, sometimes it was design work like what you see on Muskego. Uh, my wife is Ojibwe uh, from Minnesota, and her brother is a birch bark craft artisan. And we worked together for a number of years. And uh, back to your question, the the shape of the scallop uh, is often a individual builder's kind of uh, signature piece. Uh, maybe it's a family mark. Maybe it's a part of their tradition in basketry. And that was my case. I wanted to honor the Ojibwe culture, uh, especially my wife's family. And that was a, a shape. It, it's not exact. But it was kind of that upside down arc. A lot of people think it's a, you know, when the canoe is upside down, it looked like a canoe uh, or a smiley face. But I wanted to to strengthen the sidewall, which was traditional, and uh, use a family uh, gifted design. Uh, they, he gave me permission to use that, so that that's why I chose to use that design, and I used that scallop design in some variation, slight modification. Um, in I think almost everything that I've built since. And what I find is that uh, it's a little bit more time consuming to cut them out in individual pieces. I think Muskego, I might have cut several images uh, in one sheet of bark. So you might have three or four or five scallops from a single sheet of bark stitched in there. But when you look at it, you see the individual images are very um, you know, systematic throughout the sidewall. Uh, the point being though is that that scallop does reinforce the sidewall significantly. And so I like kind of a thicker piece of bark on that scallop, uh, ideally going from end to end. Uh, but if you have thicker bark, it was often omitted and sometimes plain, not uh, artistic. The other uh, technique used in that scallop is it's uh, not very often is it stitched down as well. But what I found in some of the better built canoes that were very old, that that scallop was stitched down uh, with a kind of a running smaller spruce root. And you can see mosquito it's stitched down as well on the bottom part of the scallop. And that kind of gives the bark another bite into the side bark uh, an inch or two or three below the gunnel. And it really helps not only strengthen that whole upper side wall of the canoe, but it also protects that scallop because the scallop uh, will sometimes curl a little bit. And as a result, it's usually put in, uh, the grain of the lenticel of the bark is usually, uh, at a 90 degree to the hull bark. And think of a piece of plywood. If you have several layers of, of wood and you alternate the grain, it's going to be a much stronger piece. And that's the, the one of the concepts of using the scallop, uh, putting the grain of the bark, um, Perpendicular to the, the the grain of the bark on the hull, so that that's some of the background of, of how and why scallops were used uh, to reinforce the sidewall. Um, and all tribes seem to either sometimes use them and sometimes not. Uh, at least in my experience, uh, the other thing is uh, sometimes you'll see in thicker, uh, nice art artistic uh, construction is that uh, instead of using a separate piece of bark for design work. It was simply etched. And if you've heard of the term winter bark, that refers to a sheet of bark that was taken, uh, usually in the spring or fall, sometimes in winter, uh, with the rind of the cambium stuck on it, which often produces uh, a darker red color to the bark. And then that can be softened with hot water. And then that, that rind of the cambium can be removed. Um, and it's typically the image the artistic image is left intact, so it's actually more material, and the background um, of the winter bark is scraped away, kind of a relief. Effect. And that you'll see that quite a bit. And you know, some some of the modern canoe builders, like Steve Kayard out in Maine, does a, a superb job of um, that relief etching. Another builder that I studied under was um, Henry Valencourt from New Hampshire, and um, He's done that very well, but that's a uh, that's a different tribal form out east, and that was more prevalent than the Ojibwe.
I think it was all summer bark. Okay. You know, it's I, I will say that finding good bark for canoes is one of the most difficult diff, difficult aspects of acquiring materials. And uh, I often say I look at a thousand birch trees before I find one suitable, but even that doesn't really state it correctly because there's until you start trying to find good materials, uh, specifically birch bark, uh, every tree is different. Uh, it really de depends on, I think, the growing conditions, the soils. Um, you know, I often say, look at people. You know, how many people on average are in a population for every governor that's elected to a state? It's kind of the same percentage uh, with finding the, the best quality bark for your canoe. And one thing I have learned is you use the best bark you have when you need a canoe and you build a canoe, but you're often wishing you had thicker, better bark. The other thing, though, is pitch will cure anything. And whenever there's a, a, a rip or a tear or a puncture or a crack in the bark, if it's built with pretty good construction, um, even with less than perfect bark bark, you can still continue to maintain a, a functioning birch bark canoe um, and make it work. So it's hard to find good bark, but. Well, you know, there's certainly the 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 depth of the hull, the, the beam or width, the, the length, the curvature of the end, um, the overall shape. I mean, that's pretty standard. What I would focus on and what I personally focus on when I uh, look at new canoes or go to seek out other canoes is the backstory. You know, if you can find out um, the region or especially the builder or the tribal affiliation um, or how and when it was used, uh, you know, that, that tells me a lot more about the canoe. I mean, certainly you need to have the fundamental dimension. To give you an aspect, but the tribal form and the, the backstory uh, becomes more important the more I learn about canoes as, as far as that. Um, how are we doing on time? Do I have time for a, a two minute story? Uh, the story I'm going to tell is a true story and it's very unique. Now, I've been a wilderness guide my whole life and a birch bark canoe builder and one of the few that really, you know, paddles the birch bark canoe extensively. And in 2009, I did a four month solo canoe expedition in a 14 foot birch bark canoe I built. It was the old form. Uh, it weighed about 45 pounds dry, I would say, probably 50, 55 pounds when it was waterlogged. And I took one of my dogs with me and we traveled from Grand Portage, uh, south down Lake Superior, North Shore to Duluth for 150 miles, then west inland over to the Mississippi River, uh, up the Mississippi, and then north over the High Atlantic a second time through the Canadian border uh, near International Falls on the Rainy River. And then the last uh, section of the trip, probably about a 300-mile journey, was from uh, International Falls east along the U.S.-Canada border back to my starting point in Grand Portage on Lake Superior. And that was my favorite part of the trip. It's kind of known as the the boundary waters or the border country. Uh, you go through Voyagers National Park and the, the boundary waters new area wilderness on the U.S. side, Quetico Provincial Park on the Canadian side, and it's it's a designated wilderness and it's the most pristine. It's the most wild. It's been logged over to some extent, you know, a century ago, but. It, it has the, the most wild feeling, and it's been my favorite part of that, uh, of this region for, for 40 years. I've loved it. And I knew I was heading into that territory. And so, uh, it was just a celebration of life to go in there. And I spent extra days just because I knew that once I traveled through that most remild part, things were going to change. There'd be more people present, and I wanted to savor that experience. So, one of the big lakes there is named Basswood Lake. It's on the border and on the eastern edge of the lake. And this lake, just to give you an idea, it, it feels like it's about 10 big lakes 
going in different directions, all connected. And it, it's often, uh, you know, a two-day paddle to cross the whole lake. And there's so many bays going north and south and east and west. But the one of the easternmost bays is called Bailey Bay. It's about three miles across. Uh, it's kind of round. It's also very deep. And it's notoriously windy and wavy. And this was a early July day, I believe. I was traveling from, from west to east. Uh, it was, you know, fair weather. Uh, but the wind picked up a little bit in the afternoon. I'm guessing it was about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And I was in the middle of this deep bay. And the waves were, were picking up a little bit. I was in good spirits. The dog was sleeping or, you know, just resting. Um, and we were making good time. I have a cedar paddle that is very long, kind of the otter tail or voyager shape, uh, but it's a deep blade and I can, I can make good time with that paddle. So I was stroking hard. I'm, you know, I'm in good shape. I, I've been paddling by this time for a couple months on this canoe trip and we were in a real good rhythm and I, I was just on a high because of the, the area in the wilderness I, I was coming to. And my thoughts were clear, uh, just enjoying. And I had to stay on top of the the uh, strength of my paddle stroke because of the the wind and the and the waves. But it wasn't rough seas. It was just, you know, it wasn't calm. And as I was paddling, and I want to preface this experience with again going back to the birch bark canoe for a moment, because this canoe had all traditional pitch on, and even my cedar paddle. From the time I carved the paddle from the cedar tree, there was a split in the tip of the paddle. And even though it was weakened from the start, every time I touched up the canoe with pitch, which was about average two to five times per week, so almost every night, I would also put a little hot pitch in this crack in the end of the paddle blade. And surprisingly, I never cracked that paddle further on the whole trip. But what I'm getting at is, if you think about the materials, the birch bark is not like a sheet of plastic or aluminum. It has irregularities in it. And even when it's stretched tight by the ribbing in the bottom of the canoe, it, it, it has more, uh, friction because of the irregularities of the surface. So it slows you down a little bit. Plus, I had repaired this canoe. And I actually had three seams going across the hull on the bottom. So it's one of the slowest canoes I've ever paddled, which made me paddle all the harder to get anywhere. But I think because of the vibrations of those seams and the bark itself going across the water on the canoe, plus the real pit, which had bear grease in, and my cedar blade with bear grease pitch in it, and just the aura, the energy that was put out by my thoughts and by the canoe itself triggered something through the water. And if you've ever heard of the song of the whales or the song of the spheres, it's an old concept where ancient peoples developed songs and folklore as they were out in whaling vessels. And what they found is that some of the rhythms of the whales and their voices transmitted and reverberated through the hull of their wooden boats and it affected their folk. And I mention this because what happened to me that day, that July day out on Basswood Lake, is that all of a sudden this enormous fish, I'm pretty sure it was a sturgeon, it came up from the depths of that deep lake bay and it was coming from behind me and it came up, and I think that fish was nearly the length of the canoe. I'm guessing it was about a 300-pound sturgeon, probably 200 years old, because it came up swimming fast, and it slapped the bottom of the canoe so hard that it's not just a slap. It actually lifted the canoe up out of the water and surged me forward like it was carrying me forward. And then when it submerged back underneath, that, that canoe with me and the dog and my cargo in, came back down, and then was supported back on the water. It was an incredibly powerful experience. I wasn't scared. It was more like, 
wow, here is my brother, the sturgeon, coming up to high five me. You know, give me a boost. So that was what the experience was. And how do you describe that? I have thought about that moment a lot. And as I've asked around, I've got a lot of connections with other outfitters and guides and uh, people that do expeditions. No one's ever heard of that happening before. So I think there was something that that fish identified with the natural materials and the rhythms of having a birch bark new paddle uh, on the surface of that lake that, that made that fish react that way. And here's my theory that I've come to. Sturgeon are known to grow very, very old. And that's a deep lake on the border uh, where sturgeon uh, live. You know, they were abundant throughout that area um, long ago. And now uh, there's very few left. They were overfished in the 1900. But why did that sturgeon come up and, you know, make communication with me in that community? So mm -hmm. think about that. I think it has a lot to do with the, the, the materials themselves. But maybe that old fish remembers when the birch bark canoes and the fur traders were, were paddling because that fish could have lived that long. So something to think about and just kind of another aspect when I say the birch bark canoe carries a certain power to it. I think it comes from the power within the living birch tree, the spruce roots, the cedar, all the woods, and especially the bear grease that somehow is still retained in the finished birch bark canoe, especially if it's paddled in a I think a respectful way and as one travels through the wilderness is of the mindset of you know connecting with nature so that's my true story so again imagery was often put on canoes um, more of a sometimes a you know a helper of the builder uh, that was the case with me the bear was you know was and is an important uh, uh animal in native culture especially so uh but it was my brother-in-law that uh, used that image and gave it to me and so as i built the stego i honored him by using that uh, emblem on the canoe you know another story is i was working on that canoe finishing the ribbing and it got dark i was uh on the building bed i just covered up with a wool blank blanket by the uh by the fire pit and I was going to resume at first daylight and in the middle of the night the sixth sense told me to turn around and when I turned around uh, I had a bear uh, I was about six inches nose to nose and it was he had come in because I had smoked a fish on that that fire pit rock the night before the day before and he didn't realize I was there I didn't realize he was there to the last minute and as I rolled over he he let out uh, almost like a little scream. It was a young, I think it was a young male bear, but he basically went ass over tea kettle backwards and turned around and got out of there as fast as he could because he was he was very uh, uh, surprised that I was there and vice versa. So that was kind of a uh, a lingering story that I remember, and it empowered me to use the emblem that's on the steeple. No, I do name all my canoes. Uh, different names for different reasons, but I like to use, you know, uh, uh, Ojibwe cultural words because that, that's, to me, that's a way of honoring the, the culture which the canoe was derived from. Uh, Muskego refers to kind of a swampy, marshy area, uh, and also sometimes the, the people or I guess the people that live in some, um, wetland areas. Um, it, it was just something that came to me that I found fitting, uh, largely because of the, the ricing area that where I lived and was using it. Um, it was in the Swamp River region. Um, and also the, the Grand Portage Band had people that were known, uh, to live in the, in the Muskego area down there. So it was something, just a word that, uh, had a nice, nice sound to it that uh, felt appropriate. That's how Mosquito got its name. 